uh, on view, which I invite everyone to check out. Um, it's called also Interior Lives, Photographs of Chinese Americans in the 1980s by Bud Glick. And if you haven't had a chance to see our version of Interior Lives here, we're keeping the gallery open after this discussion for half an hour. So we would, inv and we invite you to come upstairs to the second floor of the museum and check out the gallery. Uh, it's a really extraordinary exhibition of three contemporary photographers. Um, I'd like to mention that we have a program coming up in January with uh, one of the, a, a conversation between one of the three photographers featured in Interior Lives, um, Thomas Holton. He's gonna be talking to the fa some of the family members of the Lamb family that he photographed over a period of 15 years. Um, so I invite you to check that out um, and come back in January. It's called Intimate Subjects, Thomas Holton and the Lambs. Uh, I would like to thank our promotional partners for uh, tonight's event, their help on tonight's event. There's a complete list in your program and we really appreciate their support. I'd like to ask you to please turn off anything that makes uh, noise, but feel free to tweet using the hashtag MCNYLive. And now I'm gonna introduce our speakers as they come out and take their seats, uh, starting with Lynn Lin. She is the owner and executive chef of Bricolage NYC, a modern Vietnamese gastropub in Park Slope. Of Chinese heritage, Lin's parents were from Vietnam but fled to Hong Kong where Lin was born, then moved to Saratoga Springs, New York when she was an infant. There, her parents opened their own Chinese restaurant and Lynn began her career in the kitchen at age seven. She attended the California Culinary Academy and served as executive sous chef for the Slanted Door Group. Um, yeah, thank you. Then we have uh, Wilson Tang, a native New Yorker who began his career in finance but left to take over the Nam Wah Tea Parlor when his uncle, the former owner, retired. Uh, the original restaurant opened as a tea parlor and bakery in Manhattan's Chinatown in 1920. Since 2011, Tang has expanded his family's business into additional concepts in both New York and Philadelphia. And I heard he's working on a cookbook. Um, Jason Wang, originally from the Chinese city of Xi'an, grew up in New York City. His father, a veteran of Chinese kitchens, opened the first Xi'an Famous Foods in the basement of Flushing's Golden Shopping Mall in 2005 to sell dishes based on family recipes. Over the past six years, the Xi'an Famous Foods has expanded to 13 locations in the New York City area. And last but not least, our distinguished moderator, Jack Chen. He's the founding director of the Asian Pacific American Studies Program and Institute, and part of the original founding faculty of the Department of Social and Cultural Analysis at NYU. He also co-founded the Museum of Chinese in America in 1979, where he continues to serve as senior historian. This fall, Chen began his role as the inaugural Clement A. Price Chair in Public History and the Humanities, and director of the Clement A. Price Institute on Ethnicity, Culture, and Modern Experience at Rutgers University, Newark. So won't you please join me in welcoming um, this wonderful group of speakers. are very bright here, so we can't quite see you, but I'm just, I can hear the voices. Um, so thank you all for coming tonight. Uh, I'll just um, say a few opening comments. Oh, this is really, there's feedback here. Uh, if you could turn this mic down a little bit, that would be useful, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay, great, thank you, okay. <laughs> um, since I'm a historian, I just have to kind of open maybe with a, just a couple quick historical comments, uh, which is that, um, I think, <laughs> all right, that's, yeah, uh, famous last words, but um, a lot of, of course, New Yorkers uh, who are uh, older um, under, remember in New York where there are lots of laundries and Chinese restaurants. And I think what most of us hadn't realized is that that comes out of a historical experience. It's not just like Chinese are naturally predisposed <laughs> doing laundries, right? 
um, or restaurants for that matter, and it really comes out of the Chinese Exclusion Act, which most people actually don't know. So in some ways we have this kind of intimacy with the Chinese who are here. We actually don't know much about the historical context Thanks, that's, that's better. I know it's just a way to get, keep me shorter, right? <laughs> so, uh, but, um, so it's really the Chinese Exclusion Act that's, that frames, uh, which is other, uh, an otherwise very intimate experience that I think many people have with their favorite Chinese restaurants. And um, so I just wanted to say that because uh, the historical experience has very much determined the historical experience is very much determined um, why Chinese restaurants. But when the exclusion law was repealed in 1943 and then the quota was set at 105 people a year, it's not exactly as if that really solved any problems. And I, I know Wilson's family kind of goes back you know, into this period of time. Um, so in fact, one of the ways that Chinese were able to get around the Chinese exclusion laws was entering into the business of being a restaurant and rotating managers and therefore counting as an owner of that restaurant and therefore counting as a businessman who could come here uh, through the American loopholes. So in many ways, the reason why there's so many Chinese restaurants, especially in the Northeast, is really because of the Chinese exclusion laws. And in some ways, that's why there's the Chinatowns kind of stayed on the way they did. But I thought it would be important to just kind of provide that background a little bit so we understand the complexity of what we experience and also the background kind of historical reasons why some of this has happened. Um, tonight, what we thought we would do is actually, um, uh, of course, talk about the restaurants. And these are three incredible <laughs> places um, that in some ways exist. Sorry, let's just, let's take a break until we can fix the. OK, I can just, I can just speak really loudly, if that would. <laughs> My voice projects too, so. Let's try this. Sean, you want to try this one? Sorry. Is that working? Yes. OK, let's try this. Uh, so tonight, um, you're getting to hear about three restaurateurs who have amazing places and multiple places. Uh, we thought, um, rather than strictly talking about the restaurants themselves, it would be great to kind of start out with a little bit more about the families and the context in which family cooking and foods kind of framed um, really the influences that they had in the creating of the restaurants themselves. So we did this kind of fun thing where we asked them to maybe pick out their favorite uh, photograph of their restaurant and then also um, a favorite, uh, uh, yeah, and, um, and also, uh, you know, kind of a, a family dish that they really love and that'll kind of help launch um, our discussion. What we're going to do is each of them are going to say a few, a few bits about um, that, and then we're going to kind of uh, develop some threads for the discussion. Um, towards the end, we'll have about 10 minutes of time to actually have some Q&A. Uh, so let's see, I have the clicker here, and hopefully this will work. So we're going to kind of begin in this order. Um, so since in many ways there's a kind of chronology here, right, in terms of whose families have been in the restaurant business the longest. So we're going to begin with Wilson. That, that's me, right? That's you, yeah. <laughs> oh, I know that place. <laughs> well, that's the uh, good old tea parlor, um, established in uh, 1920 from the Choi family, which is the pr family previous to my family. Um, and I think the restaurant has gone through like a, a bunch of different iterations through the through the decades and um, can you talk about what year this might have been yeah yeah, yeah. so so um, very similar to what you were saying about the exclusion act um, in, in the beginning it was it was you know part of Chinatown was a very small uh, small um, little neighborhood it's Pell Street Doria Street and Mott Street and um, that was again the, the the Choi family before mine and it was really um, a, a community place. It was a gathering place where it was our, our the diners were all Chinese, 
And um, just through the decades and into the 40s and 50s where my uncle um, started working there, um, that's when I have more of a little, uh, more of knowledge of, of the history of it. And it's through the Exclusion Act that he came to uh, New York first and started as a dishwasher in this restaurant and slowly worked his way um, from you know, manager to cook. You name it, he did it. And um, at one point, the, 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 actual the actual business actually changes a lot too through the decades. And um, um, in the 60s and 70s, it was huge on uh, manufacturing of um, red bean paste. Um, my uncle was uh, using the, the restaurant as a wholesaling um, company. And uh, it was not so much of dim sum and, and tea. It was more of this kind of mass production of, uh, of uh, filling for pastries. And um, there was also a bakery component to it. And um, to keep the, the history going, like through the 70s and 80s, um, when there was more free trade between China, um, that business kind of subsided, and uh, it was more, it was back to just dim sum and small morsels, tea, of course, uh, pastries. And uh, through the 80s and 90s, it, the, the business started to decline a little bit. My uncle was getting older. Uh, it became back to a community gathering. Um, Chinatown was um, growing. Um, there was a ton of restaurants in Chinatown, and um, the tea parlor was the, the hangout for my uncle and all the uh, other Chinese chefs in the neighborhood, and that's where they would all hang out after three when dim sum hours are over. And uh, there was always a card game, there was always um, some sort of gambling, and there was always a cat in the restaurant. <laughs> um, and then, you know, past 9-11, um, the, the, the business continued to decline. Uh, my, my uncle was getting older. Um, now it became more of a, um, like a movie shoot destination. And uh, the, the primary um, income was doing Law and Order and uh, Spider-Man. <laughs> and, um, and then in 2010 was really when I stepped foot and kind of just kind of cleaned it up a little bit and um, started service again. Yeah. Jason, you look really young still. Oh, no, excuse me, uh, Wilson. Yeah, so you still, you, well, yeah, no, Jason, you also look young, but, um, <laughs> excuse me, I was just, you know, but um, at, at what point, so you, you stepped in, and how old were you when you stepped in, just so you? Um, I, I, I was uh, 31, I think, 31, yeah. So I, I'm actually 40 this year. Wow. Yeah, 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 okay. <laughs> it's the food that keeps you young, yeah, right? That's yeah, why you have to go into this restaurant. And, and the yeah. tea, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, and part of, I mean, just to know, part of the ups and downs in terms of clientele is that in 65, the immigration laws finally opened up. So Chinese families, for the first time, could reunify. Yeah. And um, it also meant that Chinese could start moving to other parts of the city. Uh, so Chinatown was not the major place that people had to go to right. all the time. It, it, and it became like Flushing and Sunset yeah. Park Sunset and Park, now yeah. even Staten Island. Yeah, yeah, just just really everywhere. So it, it changed dramatically. So we're gonna look at another image here. So what, what is this image and why did you pick it? Oh, you know, this this is awesome. <laughs> um, you know, I, 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 I grew up um, as American as I am Chinese. And this is the this is the product of being a um, a kid that had access to a microwave and <laughs> and and also a can opener and and this is this is this was literally like one of my favorite things to make after school would be a can of Dinty Moore beef stew with like some leftover takeout rice and. Um, I know, I know Barbara's in here, some, in here somewhere, but Bar Barbara f um, found this picture, and this is something that we did for um, also Hormel, um, and uh, to kind of recreate like, a, a, like one of my childhood favorites. But um, this is kind of the product of, you know, an immigrant uh, child. Uh, both parents are working. 
uh, back then in the 80s and 90s, you were allowed to have your own key to go home. Mm -hmm. uh, not so much now. Um, but that's what I did. Like, we would stock up on these kind of American products, like these canned items. And um, was spam something? That oh, so? big, yeah. Okay. big, <laughs> yeah, big. And 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 spam has made a comeback. You know, spam is a very popular it's item. Very hip um, right now. Yeah. It's hip. It's yeah. great with eggs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, this is this is by far one of my most memorable childhood. Um, not Chinese, and you know, like it's it's American, but there's like rice with it, and it, it's it really, um, yeah, it's a really um, good memory for me. Did you eat up. it with um, a fork? No, I would I would do chopsticks with it. Like we yeah. always have extra chopsticks at home, like from from the takeout restaurant, yeah. and, and my dad owned the takeout restaurant um, when I was really young, so we always had like leftover rice. Yeah, I mean, some families didn't want their kids to learn to use chopsticks and just. They yeah, didn't want them crazy. to be too they're, Chinese. They're the most, like, yeah. like, they're the best utensils, I want to say, chopsticks. Yeah. Okay, great. So now to the also very young looking Jason. Um, so, <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, tell us about this, this, uh, this photograph. Yeah. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Appreciate it. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is one of our locations. Uh, if you've heard of us, if you were in New York, you might have heard of us. Uh, we have multiple locations, um, and uh, they, I guess uh, I'll try to keep it brief, but the history of Shan Famous Foods is that, uh, so my father started in 2005, and there's a hole in the wall in Flushing um, in the Golden Shopping Mall. It's, it's, Golden Shopping Mall is still there, but we moved out of there because the whole building is just in bad shape, and they're going to tear it down soon, I think. So um, anyways, uh, I graduated college in 2009, and I, while I always kept up with the business throughout the four years of college when my father first opened it, it was just from far away. I did the website, I made the menu, I cashiered when I came back for breaks, um, or like winter breaks and stuff. Um, but I joined in 2009, started helping expand. So one by one, we used our retained earnings to open up more stores, never take on any investors. Uh, to this day, that's what I do. Day to day, I'm very involved with operations. This is our uh, 34th Street location. It's pretty close to the Empire State Building. It's also below where our office is, so I was actually just there. Uh, this is my favorite spot because, well, actually, I just really like this photo because of the nice little John Bergerman painting in the background. He does a lot of our uh, art. You know, he likes to make these little characters and noodly looking arms and dumplings and burgers and stuff. He's a funny guy, so I, I enjoy his art a lot. We feature him in our stores, but it gives you a sense of like the the flow of the store. It gets pretty busy um, during lunch times and meal times in general, and uh, but it's also came a long way since our early days where our, it's literally like I should have included like a like a side like a little picture of what the stores used to look like because we've came a long way since then and um, it's just I mean John remembers as one of our one of the customers I served you know every other day pretty much back in East Village when I cashiered <laughs> in 2009 uh, that's how I know John actually oh sorry I'm, I'm mixing up people's names Jack I'm so sorry I called the guy uh, whose name is John Andy today, and now I'm thinking John, and I'm calling Jack John. And oh, now you're just confusing me, man. No, I'm just so, anyways, so that's my that's just a photo I wanted to share, and uh, I guess I could show the f food photo. Yeah. So Leonpi cold skin noodles. Uh, Leonpi means cold skin, and um, it's that's a one, dude. Yeah, <laughs> come on, man. A <laughs> one, the first dish. It's really important to us because uh, it's the dish that made us famous. You know, people think it's the lamb burger because the late Anthony Bourdain liked it. People think it's the pulled noodles because, well, most of New York likes it now. Uh, it's not. It's not because of that. it's because of this dish. Uh, this is what some people are lining up uh, up the basement of the Golden Shopping Mall around the corner in the summer times when I was still in college. Um, this is a dish that's really difficult to make. To this day, we still use a lot of manual labor for this. There are machines that make this. There are methods of making it that's uh, a little more artificial. Ours is always made by, you know, human hands, and uh, it's it's a great dish. Uh, spicy, sour, um, great to have in the summertime. Uh, vegan, uh, so it's uh, it appeals to a, a wide uh, range of uh, folks, and it's just overall very tasty. So, and I like it. Yeah. So, um, so Wilson, your family is Toisanese. Yeah. Okay. 
So Toisan is one of the four, Sorry, yeah. four counties outside of the city of, of Guangdong, yes. Guangdong City. Yes. Um, and a lot of the Chinese in New York, Chinatown, are Toisanese. Right, so to, to kind of give my side, I mean, yeah. Chinese were, I want to say, is the kind of the original uh, immigrants. And, yeah. and fast forward to present day, um, it's just more of a different province of, of China, and it's more like Fujianese or uh, Shanghainese uh, is more dominant in the, um, in the um, immigration sector. Yeah, yeah, so a lot of the restaurants that have been Chinese were mainly Toisanese. Correct, correct. Serving maybe some variations of- mm -hmm. uh, Food from the south, Food from the south, yeah, yeah where We're fresh vegetables, fresh fish, seafood, and really, yeah. mm -hmm. You know, from my point of view, cooking really fantastic seafood and fresh vegetables, right? But Jason is kind of an outlier because your father is from a different part of China. So maybe you could just tell us a little bit about that because that's really so important to your food. Sorry, I kind of glazed over a lot of stuff. Um, so Xi'an is a city in uh, north, considered northwestern China. It's the oldest city, I would say, in China. It, it housed, it was home for like 13 dynasties and a lot of, if you go there, it's known for a lot of archaeological sites and well, it doesn't sound that appealing, like tombs. There's a lot of tombs, a lot of treasures buried around. Um, you know, it, and it's just known for the history and the culture there. So it's also known for the food being kind of like a fusion-y food. Uh, other than, you know, the traditional Chinese food of like spicy and sour foods, there's also like joining of, you know, cuisines from Middle East. A lot of our spices actually, uh, you know, when you look at them individually, you're like, huh, that actually that's not really that Chinese of a spice, it's like fennel and like coriander. And yeah. stuff. Those are more towards the West. So um, that's founded on a lot of our food and the methods of cooking, et cetera. So uh, I should mention that, you know, our fam my family is from there. My father is from there. I was born there. I lived there for eight years. I was just there maybe like a month ago, I think, and, uh, you know, enjoying food as always and checking to make sure our food is up to par to it, and you know, not to be biased, but I think it is. You know, so <laughs> you're not missing out on much. But uh, yeah, typically, just touching on a little bit about Xi'an, there's great food there. So I'm watering, my mouth is watering <laughs> as I'm thinking about it. But it's definitely worth checking out if you're ever traveling. Um, and usually they're typically like different. So there's different stores. One store will sell only dumplings. One store will only sell noodles. One store will only sell cold noodles. One store only sell like the, the burgers, right? And that's how it is over there. We're a little ambitious where we take on like a bunch of different things, but um, you know, that's why I've, you know I'm always so busy. I guess I wish we just sold like this. Then <laughs> life would be so much easier. But anyways, yeah, you know, and and also being part of the Silk Road is also really important because in some ways the, the pulled noodles really emerges from the Silk Road and the desert and the alkaline that was found in the desert to make the, um, yeah. Yes, this is a topic <laughs> that Jack and I discussed a lot when we were meeting each other. Every time we see each other, we talk a little about history, about culture, uh, what makes the food. Jack was always really into, you know, it was a, a sort of like a location-specific yeah. phenomenon that was happening with the pulled noodles is because of the water uh, had different properties with, uh, you know, more alkaline heavy properties, which naturally makes the noodle when forming the dough easier to pull. Now I would say, you know, besides our pulled noodles, there's other pulled noodles. There's the skinnier type of, what well, actually is the, the ancestor of ramen, Japanese ramen, uh, you know, the lamian from the Lanzhou region. region. Mm -hmm. That is actually like probably the more known pulled noodle. And they usually pull those to like very thin bits. Um, and they're, uh, you know, they're, they're definitely reliant on the alkaline uh, properties. For us, not as much, just because you know we pull it to wide, chewy noodles. That's what we're kind of into. But definitely, yeah, that's kind of like a Western Chinese thing with the you know pulled noodles. Yeah, yeah. So, so Lynn, which you got your your yes. your, your place. Oh, and this it does is, work. I mean, this is dramatically a different kind of look, right? Yes, it is. Um, I'm located in Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> so bring your passport. Um, <laughs> this is one of my favorite photos because um, I like to, whenever I get a chance, nap on that red couch back there <laughs> in between services. Um, but the patio is beautiful and it's currently open right now. Um, our design for bricolage uh, is a gathering of all these old 
uh, furniture and things that we found and made them useful again. So if you notice the tables in front of that red couch right there, those are actually um, manhole covers that um, I think my partner found on the street. <laughs> yeah, he's like, oh, those are cool, and we made them into tables. Um, and then all the chairs, all of them are a collection, so it's very whimsical, very beautiful. Um, and then the garden is very lush and green out there. Um, we host a lot of parties and weddings back there, too. It's very, very, very pretty. So therefore, the name bricolage. So it's that's name bricolage, yes. It's a, yeah. it's a French it's a French word. Um, and as you know, the French had colonized Vietnam for a very long time. So uh, when um, thinking of the name for the restaurant, um, we, my partners and I thought it would be great to use this French name because word because it, it did go with the um, theme of the restaurant itself and then with the food as well um, because I adapted all the food that I can, all the ingredients that we can get here and um, and made it into uh, recipes that my family used to cook um, that I grew up eating. Yeah, okay, great. So we got the next photograph. Um, so this is... This is really torture looking at these <laughs> photographs, I have to say. <laughs> So this is a dish that um, I created from my dad's recipe. There's this dish we call kaoyuk, and I actually never seen it or ever had it at a restaurant before. Um, I've only eaten at home, and my parents, my dad would make it on special occasion. It's um, a braised pork belly dish, um, and it's cooked three times. You blanch it, then you have to um, fry it, then you marinate it, then you steam it. Very, very laborious. Um, and this is my brunch version of it. So I, I, when I show, told my dad what I did with it, he thought it was amazing. Uh, so what I do is I make the kaoyuk, and then I uh, made, made it into a hash. So I added potatoes, a little bit of arugula, then you got your runny egg. Um, and brunch is where I really get to play, play with the menu um, and really do some fun stuff there at Bricolage. Tell us a little bit more about your family story and, you know, yeah. Yes, yeah, so um, my parents are refugees from Vietnam. Um, they fled Vietnam in 1970, 1979 with my sister, who was uh, two at the time, and we ended up in Hong Kong in a refugee camp there in uh, Kaohsiung. Um, that's where I was conceived and born. Um, and uh, uh, in 1981, we were sponsored to the United States, um, to upstate New York, Saratoga Springs, by a Catholic church. Um, and I lived there for 10 years. And while my parents were there, my uh, father worked in restaurants and uh, worked in construction, the things that he could do because he's un uneducated, illiterate, um, coming from Vietnam, um, where he was raised on a farm. Um, and so I grew up in the restaurant industry, uh, working at my parents' uh, Chinese-American restaurant in Glens Falls, New York. Um, and I started my career very young there, at seven years old, folding wontons and washing dishes. <laughs> I was like so short that I would have to push a chair to the dishwashing machine to <laughs> use the dishwashing machine. But my parents would pay me $10 a day, so that, that was a lot of money for me. Barbies and My Little Ponies were always in my age. Well, part of what's amazing is really um, the variety of Chinese uh, food. And in some ways, the three of you kind of represent that because um, from Toysanese, Cantonese food uh, to Xi'an, which is a very different part of China, and Chinese people just love, I, I think a lot of people just find the Xi'an food very exciting and very exotic, right? It's, it's, a, it's like a key word now. Like, Xi'an is like so exotic. Everyone wants to open a restaurant <laughs> called Xi'an something. <laughs> so it's just the you city. You popularized though. it. Anyway. <laughs> so maybe the perfume line is next, right? Yeah. <laughs> the, the fragrance of Liangpi. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the essence. <laughs> and then there are Chinese who end up in Southeast Asia. And I don't know if... You have some of that story. Yeah, um, um, my parents, they tell me many, many generations born in Vietnam. My grandparents were born in Vietnam. My great-grandparents were born in Vietnam. But they always tell me that the part of Vietnam they're from is all Chinese-speaking. Um, they call it Yi Nam Wa Kiu, the bridge. So super, super north. My mom would tell me stories that she would just look across the river and she could see China. That's how close they were. Um, so growing up, a lot of the food I was eating um, I thought was Chinese because my parents always identify culturally with Chinese, but come to realize when I became a teenager that 
it wasn't 100% Chinese food because I m would meet my friends who are actually from China and ate like Chinese food. And it was a lot of, I noticed a lot of Vietnamese food, even the language that we spoke, um, the words, <clears throat> some of the words of, of, of certain foods were different too. For example, um, my parents called fish sauce uh, nam jap. Um, that was their, the language, right? And I would always call it nam jap. That's how I grew up learning it. But in Chinese, it's actually called yu lo, <laughs> which is the proper way of saying it. Little did I know. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so it was very interesting when I, um, especially when I opened the restaurant, I had a mini identity crisis about who am I, what am I, um, because I really wanted to cook the food that I grew up eating, mm -hmm. and um, I would get a lot of comments at the restaurant, oh, this isn't authentic, it's not authentically Vietnamese, it's not authentically Chinese, <laughs> and so I'm like, well, it's authentically me and this is the food I grew up eating, so I, I was having a bit of identity crisis of trying to figure out like, who am I and what am I and what is my culture? But I think there's a, a lot of people out there who are also from, um, from you know, Waq and can um, relate to what, what I, the food that I eat too, so. <laughs> so you started feeling good that when people were willing to pay money to eat the identity that you identified with, right? Yes, so that, and, that I, and I think it's, it's a lot about just, just being exposed to it, too. Mm -hmm. um, uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of guests come in, and, and they do are curious about where I come from because they're like, oh, I visited Vietnam, and this isn't like how my mom cooked it, and then I have to explain to them, well, you know, I'm Chinese from Vietnam. And <laughs> so Jason and I have talked about this idea of authenticity, which is a tricky question, right, in all sorts of ways. Um, but in some ways, I think what you're saying helps us kind of grapple with how, in some ways, each of you are also individually putting your mark on the family cuisine or twice and East cuisine and the necessity of also, also changing things up, right, at different times. So maybe you could talk about that, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think um, food culture is constantly changing, so even even like the stuff that we serve at the tea parlor, um, that stuff has never changed. And I don't think it will ever change. But as we, as, as myself gets older and like we're trying to do different uh, concepts or different locations, you really need to adapt to what our, our clients want. So I, I in, in opening like our second place and our third place, you know, I concede to that, and um, we are making those changes. And you know, sometimes people want like a cheeseburger dumpling, and you know, we we'll we'll make that. We've we've done it, and um, order. as a special, or like it's a collaboration with another restaurant. And um, th these are kind of the things that I I've been kind of working on um, to kind of further excel in, in what I do because I think our industry is very saturated and um, food has become very popular and uh, that's the only that's the only thing that I know uh, to stay ahead or to just get that extra customer or do something different but in some ways it's also harkening back to the Dinty Moore yeah, price, yeah. Right? come full <laughs> circle yeah <laughs> so those are my kids. <laughs> <laughs> and, and what are they eating? So R Ryan's eating your uh, classic shrimp rice noodle. Um, that's at the that's at the restaurant. Um, so it's it's just a, a rice noodle sheet wrapped with uh, some uh, whole shrimp in it, steamed. And Lucy is having a lobster roll. <laughs> <laughs> are you serving lobster rolls? No, but I, <laughs> I make, I'm interesting. That that's interesting now. I mean, they got my head working. <laughs> they're they're beautiful kids. Yeah. it's amazing. Awesome. Yeah. Oh, that's, they're, they're cute. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jason, I don't know what yeah. you're you're thinking about right now. Um, yeah, I mean, um, I, when Wilson was talking about having partnerships and stuff, I, that stuff is really interesting to me. I was when I was in Cali, there was a guy there. Oh, I forgot his name. But he's also in food. You guys might run into each other sometimes. Um, he has this idea of putting like a bolo ball, like using that with fried chicken. 
put a fried chicken inside bowl, but that's like chicken and waffles kind of. And if you take like Howling Rays over there, which is like that spicy chicken joint, and you put that in, can you imagine? That's pretty cool. Yeah. Anyways, I'm just randomly, because that stuff almost <laughs> killed me, the Howling Rays chicken. So spicy. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Oh my yeah. gosh, man, this stuff is spicy. Anyways, um, don't go for this, the howling level. Just go for the medium. As a person who sells spicy foods, oh man. Anyways, um, authenticity, right? So for us, we're sort of trapped. The, the reason I envy folks like Wilson, who's like innovative, who's able to, you know, and even like also like Shake Shack and all these like big places where they do collapse, I really envy that because we're sort of stuck where we are now. We can't really do that because we're pegged at that point where we're known to be authentic, right? But even with that, our food is not purely authentic. Depends on how you define authenticity. Authenticity as in, all right, well, people always do this. You go on Yelp, you see all sorts of stuff all sorts of crap. And uh, you'll, you'll see that uh, people are like, oh, I'm Chinese. I'm from Xi'an, or I'm, I was there for school. And I've never seen any of this stuff. Who put cilantro on the Ampi noodles? You don't see that. This place is not authentic. But the, th the question is this. I'm from there. I like the taste. My family's from there. My grandfather, grandparents are from there. Uh, they like the taste. So what does it matter? Every family cooks differently. We like to use cilantro. Other people don't. We didn't go to China before we opened the business and say, hey, you know, what did these people serve on the streets? Let's copy them and then sell the exact same thing over in the U.S. and make some money. No, it was really just what our family recipes were. So, and these days, too, some of our top sellers, like spicy cumin lamb burger, spicy cumin lamb noodles, spicy tingly beef, those, you, you won't find, you will find some combination of those. You'll find spicy cumin lamb. It's a pretty common dish. You'll find tingly beef of some sort, like a, maybe like in an iron pot or something, in Sichuan or something. But you're not going to find those combinations. The burger is typically served with beef or it's like stewed beef or stewed pork. Or, and, uh, but we put like cumin lamb in it, uh, which is kind of different. So authenticity is defined by us in our business. Uh, and the only bound, uh, like the binding things that we really have to adhere to, the rules are that it has to p appeal to our taste buds as, you know, my, in terms of what I like, what my family will like. Uh, well, you know what my ex-girlfriend would like because she's from Xi'an and uh, she's a big <laughs> proponent of our food. Uh, we're still on good terms and uh, she, <laughs> I know she's ordering our food because right now we're on caviar, trycaviar.com, just some of our dishes. And I'd look at all those orders. I'm not a stalker. It's just, I'm just checking to see what people are ordering. <laughs> no, it, it sends emails to me. And then I just look to, to see what people are ordering to see what we're selling, right? What store is selling what? And then I, I see like her name there. And I like ah, oh, and I see an order from Midtown. I see an order from Midtown. I, I'm like, all right, so we're still on good terms. You still like that? So, <laughs> well, I mean, anyways, yeah. Jason, so, I've, I've known you for a little bit, but I've never heard about your ex, but also your ex ex, because you were telling us about your ex ex yeah, too. Oh, God, I said too, I've said too much. I've said too much. You know everything about me now. <laughs> Anywho's. Um, so authenticity is only by, for me, it's just bounded by the taste. As long as someone from that region or from that general region of China can accept it, the gra your grandmother, if you're Chinese, you're working or studying in New York, your family's come over to visit you, you bring them to the store, they're like, mm, I want to order a second taste, right? That is authenticity to me. Not necessarily what your impressions of the food is, what you're known, you know, what you know as, you know, historically or whatever, so. You, you know, I, I to, to add to that, I, I also need to kind of, I, I think I want to remind everyone that like opening a restaurant in New York City is, is not for the faint of heart. And, and, you know, it's this fine line of balancing art and commerce. Mm -hmm. And when you let the art side of the food take over the commerce side of it, that's a recipe for disaster. And so if it's, whatever it is, if it's, tingling beef, pork, whatever. I think on the back end, we're looking at our product mix and, hey, that sells. We're, we're gonna push that item because if, if we're gonna go like authentic, oh, hey, in Xi'an, it's, they don't put cilantro, but like our customers want cilantro. I don't know, I, I would side on putting cilantro and, and not worrying about what other people think, but like as long as it's, it's selling, it's, balances the art and commerce of, of things, then it, it should be a go. 
Uh, yeah, food is so subjective. And I also think a lot of people have different um, definitions of authenticity. Um, and authenticity and traditional are usually, I see you, it, um, used interchangeably, but I, I, I do define them differently for myself. And I believe like authenticity is something that can't be disputed at origin, I think from the um, uh, internet definition of it. And tradition is, you know, something that's been um, passed down from family or something that's been originally done in a certain way. For example, my dad's kaoyo. You know, only I've seen it in my family. My uncles make it. All of my, even my uncles, all of them have a different version of their own version of it. And so we always like try to compete and bring and bring it to these special occasions. And everyone has their own kaoyo, and we can see who's, who's is better. <laughs> um, but yeah, authenticity I, th I think is definitely uh, from from the heart. If you're cooking from the heart and it's um, something, the flavors that you recognize and love, um, then it is authentic. Okay, so can I just add one last one? And I know we haven't gotten to you yet, Lynn. So um, about uh, about what Wilson said, right? I agree. Food business is a business. My my dad especially believes in that. He'll be like, why would you be wasting your time if you're not making money? Like for the art of it, what's what's the point of that? He's, he'll be like, you're stupid. You know, like, uh, here's, and you know, Joe knows, right? What's up, Joe? Uh, yeah, you know my father pretty well from the old days. I, I, but um, but to Wilson's point though, I, I get that. It depends on your business strategy. If we're, we're talking more business operations now. If your clientele is the people that are into what's adaptive and new and innovative, that's fine. But for us, like, I actually find value in being conservative with our food because that's what my clientele likes. And um, because they, there are some people who like to tell you, I want this, 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 this way. I want this topping that way. And they love that. That's the customization. That's what they are buying it for. For us, I guess we cater more to people who are like, tell me what I should get. Tell me how it should taste. I trust you with the taste of it. And just, you know, take me away, you know, to Flavor Town. And uh, that's kind of what, <laughs> what the type of folks we, I like personally, because I'm like, you, you trust me with it, I'll make it good for you. But uh, don't tell me how to make it though, so. Anyways, so, so you a little will, bit of difference. But. So you will not make um, cheeseburger or young pea noodles. Well, all right. We, like, if you don't want cilantro, we'll, we'll take cilantro. Out. If you're allergic to something, yeah, of course. Like, we'll tell you what you can't have, and we'll also take out what we can, right? But, like, I'm not gonna like put. Oh man, I've gotten into like fights and stuff years back with like it's not worth it, you know. As I got, I'm 30 now, but I was 23 at one point, <laughs> and I've yeah. I've gotten into like shouting matches with people who was like want to put lamb on their lamb pea. My dad would do it because again, he's a business person. He's like. She want to pay for it? Why not? We make money, you know? And I'm like, I'm a stubborn, kind of a OCD type of person. I, I'm like, no, that's not how it's supposed to be. That's a slippery slope, you know? Once you start doing that, you can customize everything then. So, and that's not operationally subject. Anyways, so, yeah, sorry. But so yeah, sorry. again, like taste is very subjective. And I think a really good example is like all those Chinese American restaurants out there, the history of why there are those restaurants that exist. It's because when the Chinese came here, they were trying to appease the American taste. So they got the, the more sweet and sticky and all those things. Like a lot, of, when I grew up in a Chinese restaurant, my parents had that kind of restaurant. It was um, 1980s, it was the poo-poo platters with the fire in the middle and the Polynesian drinks with the fire. <laughs> um, <laughs> and and our, our clientele, we're in upstate New York, so it is mostly Caucasians and that's that, what they that's wanted. That's making it a comeback. Huh? The poly, the, the, I, I know yeah. I love it. I was actually thinking of doing like tiki, tiki drinks. I started yeah. doing tiki drinks at bricolage. Um, and so my parents would cook this food, but this is the food I grew up eating or what we ate at home. And after, after dinner service, my parents would cook us completely something different. We'd have a whole steamed fish and a boiled chicken and vegetables, you know? There was no, there was no sweet and sour chicken and, and um, General Toe's chicken and um, <laughs> all those other things. You know, that was something that was the American food. And I mean, I, it does hold a cl close place to my heart because I do crave that sometimes. And <laughs> what, what about um, banh mi? So, you know, one of the best banh mi sandwich places that's been rated, but is in my neighborhood in Sunset Park. I go there all the time. But nope. how would you talk about banh mi given your definitions of authenticity and tradition? Well, banh mi is actually came from the French. So the, the Vietnamese actually, a lot of their cuisine, a lot of their food 
has been adapted from the uh, their environment and the cultures that that they had been immersed in. Um, so the bread actually came from from the French and all like a lot of I see a lot of overlap, you know, with uh, because the uh, Vietnamese we have the pate too, and that's very French. Um, we have the the head cheese, like all those charcuterie, a lot of charcuterie, and that's also from the French. Um, and in the um, so. A traditional bun mi. I mean, when when did it become traditional? You know, with the first person who made a bun mi, they were like, "Hey, this is an authentic Vietnamese. This is like some kind of French fusion thing." You know, but now it's it's known as traditional traditional Vietnamese food, and it's delicious. I love bun mi. I love my good bun mi. You're talking about one on eighth, right? Yeah. Delicious. It should. <laughs> delicious. Oh, delicious. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's um, uh, let's look at this photograph here. Yeah, that's my jerk dad. Uh, so I fight with him every day. Anyways, I guess I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this. This is in our Flushing store. Um, we, we don't, I don't, we have a complicated relationship. Um, I don't, see, notice we're not smiling. Because he doesn't smile in photos. And I think of smiles, smiling next to him as a sign of weakness. So I don't smile next to him. I think words like I love you or uh, thank you are weakness words. <laughs> so I don't say those around him and he doesn't say it to me. He never compliments me ever. Um, he's like, you're all right, but you're, you, I'm just this much better than you at everything. So <laughs> you're good at English, but that's all you're good at. And computers, and computers. So anyways, um, you know, he started the business. He, um, I, I didn't go into this, but you know, he worked in restaurants for decades. Um, when I was going to middle school and high school, around I lived in Connecticut, I lived in New York. Uh, I went to finish off high school in Queens, and then, anyways, so that's how, how he kind of started um, restaurants, all sorts of like buffet restaurants, you know, stuff out out of state. Um, but yeah, so that's us, that's us, and uh, I'd like to think of us as a family business, and um, yeah, it's still that way now. Yeah, so a lot of tension in that, you know, yeah, a lot of tension there. Well, you know, I mean, part of it is I was struggling with some of these same questions with my father, okay, um, was that, you know, we're, okay, so the Chinese, a lot of the Chinese traditional cultural attitudes, talking about tradition, is not about individual genius, but it's about, um, and not about discovering who you really are and supporting Jason for who he really is as a person, you know, but it's it's basically hard, it's, it's hard, or me, you know, but it's hard work, right? So everybody is capable of, of everybody's intelligent if they, w if they apply themselves, right? This sounds familiar, right? And they practice the piano or, you know, do the business or are diligent and just, so everybody's capable of doing that. So in some ways there's a kind of a democratic attitude. It's not so much about the special person in each of us, right? Which is a very American kind of attitude, the individual, right? So, so in some ways, we're okay, right? We're all right. <laughs> and, and also you've clearly proven that you've done this amazing thing in terms of opening up all these places. Yeah. I don't even know how to take a compliment like that. I'm just like, <laughs> if I say, say thank, you, thank you, it's like I accept the compliment. But then like, I feel like, I don't know. It's just, well, thank you. But um, I, I try and, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. That's that's the feeling, right? So it's uh, never good enough kind of feeling and uh, just always improving. Um, yeah, that's kind of like what I grew up with. And uh, that's how I view business as well. I guess relating back to the stores, I don't think we're good enough. I always look, that's why I'm so busy because I work on stuff that, like, if I just let it hang, it could still make money. I could probably go on vacation a little more. Uh, I still do go on vacation. It's very necessary now because I'll, I'll just go insane otherwise. But um, <laughs> it's, it, is, uh, it is something that I just obsess over. I want to make sure everything is right. I don't feel like we're doing everything right. And there's always someone doing better than I am in some aspect, um, whether it's food, whether it's service, whether it's, uh, decoration, uh, you know, environment that you're eating in. Um, you know, I, I just want to do this for the sake of doing better. It sounds weird. It's not even like, yes, we're a business. We have to make money. But I, I don't look at sales. I don't even know. We don't have budgets. I don't do monthly reviews. I have to pay the taxes. That's why I start worrying. I'm like, oh, my gosh. How do we <laughs> How do we have to pay that much in taxes? And then uh, that's why I look at numbers. But throughout the year, I'm like, whatever. As long as people are happy, people are giving good reviews, I'm, um, you know, Still invited to these events, so I'm still relevant, <laughs> and uh, you know uh, that that's good enough for me. Uh, you know, so cool. 
Well, part of what you're raising is also the precarity of having a restaurant in New York, as you were talking about earlier. Um, how do you, so there's a generational shift, perhaps, in terms of how to deal with that, and also all three of you, in some ways, have a lot more knowledge of New York City culture and people who are not Chinese and people are not Xi'an, you know, I mean, people are not Chinese, you know, so each of you have your own kind of resources from your growing up experience. Uh, uh, Leanne, you know, Lynn, Lynn, I know you grew up in, you, part of your time, besides being in Sarasota, you're also in LA, right? And those two cultures are very different kinds of places. I'm just curious what you picked up in each of those places, but also what you brought here to set up in setting up Ripolage. Okay, yeah, I um, did my middle school, college, and culinary school in California, um, and uh, started my cooking career in Northern California. And there, um, it is very much what they say in Berkeley, it's very hippity-dippity, and we're all about you know the granola eating, and um, eating local and sustainable, and uh, not fussing with the ingredients too much, uh, because California is America's fruit basket. Um, everything comes from a lot of uh, produce and fruit comes from California. And so um, I did learn to uh, really respect ingredients and not do too much with it, let the ingredients speak for itself. Um, but California, the weather is, is all year round gorgeous there. So I had a Meyer lemon tree in my backyard and I had Meyer lemons all year round. You know, and you don't get that in New York. New York is definitely very seasonal. And when um, summertime is my favorite because of the heirloom tomatoes and then the fall is the apples. And there's some amazing produce and great things in New York too, but it's, it's very seasonal as well. So a lot of stuff comes from California, comes from Mexico, comes from Canada, comes from um, different parts of the United States where you know they can grow things better. Um, so I feel like when I opened Bricolage that I brought some of that San Francisco uh, sensibility and flair to the restaurant. Um, for one example, not really food related, but um, we're really, in California, we're really big on composting. Um, and over here, I know in New York, they when I first started the restaurant, they did not require anyone to do composting. Um, and to have that service, I had to pay extra for it. Um, and I still do pay extra for it, and I think it's well worth the the money to to do that. I think that's our responsibility as a restaurant to be able to um, compost and take care of the environment and our community that way. Yeah, um, let's look at your photograph that you picked. <laughs> so this is a picture taken, yeah, in 1988. Um, my siblings. Um, the only person that's missing here. Let's see, what? <laughs> is James because he was not born yet. He was born in eighty nine and he's my brother. So which he's, one are which one are you? I am two of seven. <laughs> so I'm the second the second one. The they second? were all in order right here. Okay. So it's Kathy, Lynn, Lisa, Susan, Sarah, Christine, and then James, who's not pictured here right now. Um and my yeah, my parents really wanted that boy. It, it it's a <laughs> Again, it, it's a cultural thing, right? Because the boy is supposed to carry on the family name and that's how you carry on. And, and so, yeah, they had to have a boy. And I asked my parents, I'm like, so would you have stopped if James was a girl? And they're like, we would have kept on going. <laughs> we'll get that boy. And you know what, it actually worked out well for them because now that we're all grown up and all college graduates and you know, they wear their retirement fund. You know, they didn't, I mean, they were uneducated um, living here and they worked blue collar jobs. They had that restaurant. They don't know 401k. They don't have savings. They had to raise us nine, the, the seven kids. So now that, you know, we, we see how, how hard my parents have worked. And um, so now all of us, now that we're all grown up, we all pitch in every month to take care of them and make sure they're taken care of. Yeah. Uh, yeah, my, my dad always said, you know, um, Home, basically home is where the hearth is in, in Chinese. He, his favorite time is when everyone gets together and um, enjoys a family meal. He uh, renovated his current home um, and his dining room can seat 60 people. <laughs> yes, 60 people. We can fit six ten tops in there. Um, because he loves to entertain. He loves to have family over. And of course we have the karaoke and everything as well. Um, and in California we all cook outside. So everyone has like their wok burners. I call it the wok barbecue. It's like this uh, 
propane tank attached to this um, this metal wok burner, and my dad has a whole kitchen set up outside. And for my wedding, we did uh, we served 200 people at my dad's house <laughs> <laughs> with all my uncles cooking outside and everything. <laughs> it was it was hilarious, um, <laughs> quite a sight to see. But yeah, it was always centered around food, and I think that's what really drew me to the industry and also wanting to stay close to my culture because I moved here when I was so young. I lost the language. I've lost all the traditions, um, you know, with the red shrine and, and doing all the, the ancestor worshiping. Um, I've lost all of that. So the only way that I feel like I'd stay close to my culture is through the food. Um, also, food represents uh, clearly relationships um, love, right? And it's, it's a way of expressing the love. So, so um, yeah, so Jason, everything's okay because... <laughs> you guys share your love of food. I was looking, I was waiting for you. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I just had to take that. Yeah. <laughs> I don't, we're just kidding. We know each other, so it's all right. <laughs> we're cool, we're cool. So we're going to open this up. We, we have a little bit of time for two or three questions. So we'd love your your thoughts, comments, anything, especially any of you who come out of restaurant families, we'd kind of love to hear maybe some of those stories that might connect to this. So um, I can't really see you, but let me let me stand over here to see your hands. Um, anybody wanna make it? Yes, um, right, the woman in the, in the middle there, yes. Okay, hi guys. Um, Jack, I'm a fan of yours. I saw you at the Chinese Exclusion Act documentary, so that was cool. It's cool to see you again here. Um, Jason, I met you in like a, um, an Elmhurst restaurant, like oh. Penang. You may have been with One X or X number two, I don't know, but like. Wait, is I it was the Malaysian the, I, one? She was the Victoria's Secret model? Yeah. Well, yeah, uh, all right, okay, cool. Former, former. Good to see you guys again. Um, so yeah, a question about uh, racism. Um, this is like, you know, so you talk, we talk about Chinese Exclusion Act. The, the fact that Chinese are in the restaurant industry is is, is a product of, of severe racism, structural, you know, governmental, all that stuff. You guys, um, there's a generational journey in terms of that, right? Your parents were able to overcome and, you know, like put you through school and all that stuff. So that's that's a generational journey. Um, the second, th so that's just something like I think is a, is a theme of tonight and, you know, wanted to like commend. Um, the second thing is that, um, there's also a personal journey, right? You all could have not become, you know, into the restaurant world. I'm like not from that restaurant world, and so it's like really cool to see what like families who came from that industry also go back. So I'm curious about the personal journey for each of you, where you know you were in finance, you were thinking of like you had the, you know, you were in school, like not Let's trying start. to learn school, you know. And then I I know you you know you you attended culinary school and all that stuff, but at some point you know you didn't have to do Vietnamese food or, or Chinese food at all. You could have stayed in the French world. So there's a personal journey in terms of um, your work. Like why did you choose to open this restaurant or go back to this restaurant, um, and why the, not only the calling right, but like this particular thing that you're doing right now. Thanks. Um, so my personal journey. So I think I grew up like a lot with um, like. Like these guys here, where parents were very, very strict and really wanted us to get an education and do better than they did. You know, they were uneducated, illiterate, and they wanted all of um, my siblings and I to succeed and to do well in school um, and not work in the restaurant industry. So when I did tell my parents that I just I wanted to go to culinary school, they were very, very disappointed. Their question was like, "Why would you want to do that to yourself?" I mean, sometimes I ask that right now, but um, <laughs> like, mom and dad, you were right. No, but overall, I love it. I mean, you guys know it's know. It's, it's a struggle. Um, um, but yeah, I actually like out of high school, um, I went. I was actually attending uh, University of Southern California, and um, I was studying public policy management and planning. And and then um, halfway through, I was like, you know what? Don't want to do this anymore. And then I told my parents, I'm leaving USC to go to culinary school, and they. Well, they didn't, weren't paying for it. Like all seven kids, all of us, scholarships, grants, financial aid, we, every single one of us graduated. Um, all of us went to university and all of us paid for our own education. I'm still paying off my loans right now because USC is a private school. <laughs> um, and um, when I went to culinary school, I really was, uh, really wanted to cook French food. 
you know, I was I was uh, I was admiring like all oh, the French cuisine. I thought really highly of it. And um, after completing culinary school, I realized that you know what, I'm not really into that kind of food, and realized that I really wanted to just cook from the heart and cook the things that I that I knew how to cook and that I loved and enjoyed and wanted to share that. Um, and opening a restaurant wasn't um, my my first career choice after going to culinary school. I thought, you know, I'd get like a nice executive chef position somewhere, nice and cushy, get, you know, 401k and vacation and everything. You know, because my parents were like, okay, opening a restaurant, it's it's very difficult. You know, your every problem is your problem. You, you work seven days a week and it, it this is true. Um, <laughs> um, but you love it though, because there's so many perks that do come out of owning your own business. Um, but it is a, a a balance of time and family and finances and art. Sometimes it's been a, it's been a struggle. I don't know. I've, I've been around for three and a half years now in the restaurant industry, so I'm still considering myself a newbie um, and still figuring things out. But I, I love what I do, and you have to love what you do. Cool. I'll try not to go too much. Um, we, uh, yeah, I, I, I went into this business because I did not want to see the food from my hometown just disappear or bastardize sorry for the language is that a bad word Bast no. is that a proper word to use because yeah. it has okay cool <laughs> anyways um so i was in college i graduated college i was working so before college when i was in high school i made websites i made you know i like to do things i like to get i had like to take ownership of something right after college i was working uh, for corporate and merchandising for like target in minneapolis right so um that was really boring for me, um, and but it was you know a corporate job, so I was like, all right, I'll do this. Uh, they enticed me with the whole own your own business uh, thing when they were recruiting me, because you get to own your own department for merchandising, furniture. You know, like I get to order furniture. So, anyways, um, not to crap on like corporate. I actually really admire people in corporate life because they have structure, they have departments they could call on. Oh, I could just ask IT. I could ask accounting about that. Be like, all right, well, I'll ask this guy next to me. I hope he knows the answer. Otherwise, I'll have to do it. So that's kind of like what I've been dealing with. It's getting better over the years, though. Our team is expanding. But um, my personal journey is when I realized how popular, I mean, how, how I got into the business, I guess. That part of my personal journey is that I realized, like, so many people like this food. And if I don't help my father, who's, I wouldn't say he's illiterate, <laughs> illiterate but he's pretty bad with, like, a lot of stuff. He's good with starting something, but he's bad with, keeping it going. He's bad at following through on some things and just planning. He'll make it work his own weird ways. But anyways, I just think that it'll just somehow collapse and someone else will capitalize on it and do it in a weird way where, you know, uh, I want to do it right the first time. I want to leave an impression for American diners to really understand what it's supposed to be, um, what the food is supposed to taste like um, as I grew up with it. So that's really my motivation into coming here. And besides, as I was saying, I like to do something on my own. I didn't know what it was throughout college. I had no clue. I did like, I was working for Yahoo. I worked in the finance. I was never a banker banker, like this dude here. Um, but you know, like I, banker, right, or consultant. Something high up, you know, Wilson right here, you know, he's like, <laughs> I never made it. I didn't get to go into Morgan Stanley, but they didn't want me. Uh, so. <laughs> That's kind of um, my journey, and then I pretty much these days what motivates me, what keeps me going is just, I just don't want to see it fail. I just want to make a mark, you know? Like, I don't want to, sp I've been in this business nine years now. I It will be, wait, eight years or nine? Nine years now. So when I reach 10 years, I hope it's still going strong because I don't want to say I wasted the last eight, nine, 10 years of my life doing something stupid and that, that failed that I can't be proud of. So that's really my motivation. That's why I want to make sure it goes well. It's not, yes, fine, we all, it's a business. We have to make money from it. I'm not like broke, I, I'm broke after the tax bills. But um, it's, you know, it's, um, but that's not what keeps me going to search for new problems every day. It's really just make, just wanted to do it right. That's all. So I don't know if that answered the question. I think for me it was pretty, pretty easy. Um, as a native New Yorker, um, I was given this opportunity to kind of keep a close to a century-year-old restaurant alive. You know, I'm a, I'm a kind of old history geek or old New Yorker, you want to say. Um, and places like Namwa on Doria Street just don't exist anymore. 
um, you wouldn't even be able to fake it, you know, because there's just, it's so real. Um, everything about that restaurant is old. And um, I am up there on the iconic level of a Russ and Daughters of Lower East Side or a um, Cat's Deli. And um, I'm just doing my little part to keep um, old New York old uh, um, uh, amongst the change, you know. And, and I'm part of the change as well, you know. And, and I've kind of got my feet in both worlds. So, or, or I could have sold insurance. <laughs> so, I think I made, I made a, a, a good choice. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think we had one more. Okay, yes, yeah, somebody's really raising their hand, right? Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah. Hi, this question is for Lien. Uh, we love your restaurant. We are in the neighborhood and we eat there all the time. When we're not eating there, we think about the different dishes. But that's for another <laughs> Thank time. Thank you. So what was the turning point for you three and a half years to open the restaurant? And knowing how much you liked California and the sustainability of the food, why did, why did you decide to move to Brooklyn? Oh, that is a good question and a, and, a, and a fun story. So I was living in California and I had just had my son Jackson um, working for the Slanted Door for over 10 years with the same company and I love that company. They are my family. I grew with them. They had one store and by the time I left, they had six different locations of different restaurants and I was a part of that. Um, and then I had the amazing opportunity to do some uh, food and beverage consulting over here in New York City. And my husband and I thought it would be wonderful to come on an adventure over here. Um, so we just picked up, packed up our bags and, and, and moved over here. Um, uh, the consulting uh, lasted about a year. And after that, we were deciding whether we want to go back to California or stay in New York. And so during the summer, we were doing like little odds and end jobs, like helping people move furniture and things. Um, and and we we're like, well, if we can find a job here, maybe we'll stay here for a little bit longer. I, you know, I wasn't, I, was, I didn't feel like I was done with New York yet. So we looked on Craigslist and uh, found a listing that said, uh, there are uh, two guys looking to open a Vietnamese restaurant, looking for a chef, part, possible partnership. I'm like, hey, that sounds like us. So <laughs> we called them, and the rest is history. And then Bricolage was born about eight months later. It was that fast. Yeah, my husband, love him to death. You know, I work with him. I think that's one thing we all have in common, too, is we work with our family. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yes, father of my children, business partner, love of my life. Um, <laughs> he's amazing. Um, and we didn't even hire a general contractor to do any of the work. And we were open that restaurant. Once we signed that space, we opened in four months with Ed doing all the work and my partner. Yeah. So why Brooklyn? Oh, because we lived in Brooklyn and we really loved the feel of Brooklyn. It really reminded me of, uh, of where we lived in California. You know, we're in, in uh, El Cerrito, which is just a couple, just north of Berkeley. Uh, one more question, yes, please. You know, you three of you have related the history. I can talk for that. Oh, it does? Um, and you have various traditional, historic references. But going forward, would you say that this model would work for your kids? Are they going to try and do what you're doing? Because what you're doing is much more American than it is traditional, work hard, make sure your kids all become doctors, dentists, investment bankers, you know? That's the t traditional thing. I mean, I know exactly what you're talking about, what your parents drum it into you, you have to succeed, you have to pay for your education yourself because they couldn't afford to send you to school. That's so typical. But I'm not going to tell anyone of the next generation to do that. I'm sure you're gonna take care of your kids and send them through school. If, if you follow me on ins Instagram, <laughs> I put my kids to work. <laughs> they will mop, they will wipe down the table. Hashtag family contribution. <laughs> so that's, that's my answer. I, I will not let my children not work. That's the way I grew up. 
they will work. And um, it's, it's all about starting it young for us. So my, my children are, as you saw, four, they're four and six. And um, I, ch ch <laughs> but um, they, they're at the restaurant, they're at most, all, all of our locations. We, I specifically set time out. This is part of my routine. They're gonna go in and either wipe something down, sweep something, and I am very vocal on that on all of my social media channels. Like, put your kids to work, because that is how they will grow up knowing the value of what hard work is. And it's not, you can't, you can't get an app to do it. You can't get an, a, a computer to do it. There's, there's no app for it. It's your two hands. Yeah. I, absolutely, absolutely. And the, the, the you know, the way you said it to is just the, with gusto. That's, yeah. I, I agree hundred percent. Big, big like, proponent. I'm, I'm sending my kids to China, like in the <laughs> in the rural areas. All right. So I've been in the U.S. for 22 years now. I came when I was eight. So I'm 30. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and uh, I, I basically, I, I really like this whole like dual existence that I have. I'm not super American, even though I am American technically. I'm not Chinese enough because I, I don't know, like when people go on Weibo, like I could read it, but I don't understand the slang these kids be talking about these days, right? I don't even understand American slang now. I'm like stuck in the between. I'm that type of Asian where I'm not fobby enough, like fresh off the boat enough, and I'm also not ABC enough, right? So it's weird, but I really enjoy that, and I want my kids, I don't have any kids, by the way. You guys, good for you. I have cats and one dog, so. Um, yeah, they're my kids. Uh, anyways, when I do have kids, when I if I do have kids, I, hopefully I do. I, I want a family. Um, they, they'll be put to work. I'm gonna send them like Xia Twin, like going to the rurals, right? Like what my parents went through Cultural Revolution. Everyone goes to rural areas to do some physical labor in the farms uh, with pigs and horses and everything. I would love some sort of program that allows kids to do that. I don't know. Maybe they'll come up with it. But the point is, like Wilson said, they have to understand that nothing is not, it shouldn't become easy. It, it's, for me, like I was never put into that position, but I never was, I didn't, I had to kind of work for everything. If I wanted something, I had to work for it. If I wanted, I, I felt, I don't know how my mom or my dad made me feel that way, but I feel guilty if I spend money because I know they're working hard at it. So like, that's why in high school I made websites because I want to be comfortable with spending my own money. And when I was in elementary school, I delivered newspapers, right? Like with the big bag and stuff. It was like pretty, pretty fun, actually. Um, but, you know, you give tip like a dollar and you're like, oh my gosh. So th those were fun for me. And I wish, I don't know how to instill that into kids, but I think that's something I want them to do. I don't want them to go to private school. Uh, I want them to go through public school with all the drugs and all the, <laughs> all the talks about like all the sexual stuff that goes on in middle school now. You know, it's messed up. I'm just like, kids are freaking delinquent these days. But in a public school, they get to choose, they get to meet different people. Hopefully they choose the right kids to hang out with. And that's something that as parents, we should steer them towards, I think. But I want them to have that experience, to know the world's not just, you know, in a boarding school. It's not just the private school and, and stuff like that. So uh, I agree with you, man. Like, I don't know. Thank I'm going to ask you for parenting advice when the time comes. You got it. Con By then, consulting, you'll have a lot of parenting tips on how, yeah, exactly, how to, you know. Yo, that, that is a whole other panel discussion about parenting. Um, yeah, I'm going to make, yeah, I'm gonna make my, my kids pay for their own education. I mean, all their Lycee right now, every time they get a Lycee, I'm like, this is going into your college fund. And my older son actually like, oh, yeah, put that into my college fund. And he's like, can I take a dollar for a Pokemon card? I'm like, ugh. And I do make him work at, at yeah, work, yeah, too. Yeah, you, you, you know, it's, it's washing vegetables. It's, you know. It, Using I, the meat yeah, grinder, yeah, feeding yeah. it through, yeah. yeah. It's, Peeling that's, carrots. That's nor normal. And I, I mean, take that's... the opportunity to teach him math at the same time. I'm like, okay, Jackson, every carrot you peel, you get 10 cents. How many carrots have you peeled and how much money do you get? Yeah. And now you and your friend did it, so you're going to split the money. So how much money do you each get? So maybe we can have a program um, 20 years from now back here, <laughs> yeah. and we'll, s we'll have your kids yeah, be, on the, be on, on the panel, panel. Yeah. and we'll play this back, and we'll yeah. see what they're saying. <laughs> but, um, maybe just to close, um, I know you've got, some of you have a cookbook coming out. Maybe you want to give a plug? 
Yeah, yeah. So we are working with a. Uh, we're working on a cookbook. Uh, my cookbook writer is here, Joshua. Um, it will it will be a combination of recipes, um, stories, um, and neighborhood characters. Neighborhood meaning um, the people I surround myself, like the the guy that sells the beef jerky, the guy that makes the noodles, like key people in my community. Cool. I I have a book coming out. Um, <laughs> it's, a, it's a cookbook, so there will be a lot of recipes in there. And uh, I know a lot of folks have been waiting to make their own editions of our food, and uh, this book will lay it out. So um, fall, I think fall 2019, but I'm supposed to be working on it now. I'm just kind of behind on it, but I'll get it, I'll get it done. Oh, we, yeah. us too, so. Yeah, it, it's just, it takes time. it's hard, it's hard yeah. work, so bravo to what you do. And so, so I know it's a lot of work, so. Yeah, um, I am also uh, have a cook com coming out. It's uh, actually a collaboration with a group that I, a group of chefs that I, I uh, hang out with called Asian Food Mafia. Um, we're a bunch of chefs in uh, Brooklyn and also in uh, Manhattan, and we get together monthly and we uh, be each other's shoulder cry on and share share stories. And we're all chef owners of our own restaurant, um, and so we are. <laughs> so yeah, we are coming out with an ebook um, this winter, and uh, just a bunch of us with our recipes and stories about who we are and what we do. Um, it's called Asian Food Mafia Cookbook. Can, can, I, can <laughs> I ask who's in this mafia? Okay, so know you know anyone? you know Chris Chung. Yes. From East Wing Snack Shop. Yes. We call him Daigo. He's he's yeah I I, I know. You Chris. should come. Yes. You should come. It's fun. It's a fun yeah, group. Yeah, I love. We we, we do these late. This industry we love we, what we do is we get together I, late night eats. I can't hang with them. They they hang out too late. <laughs> yeah, I know with the kids. The kids, you have to get a babysitter. Yeah, because we all own our own restaurants, so we can only hang out at 10 p.m. and we hang out from like 10 to 12, and we hang out and um, we just talk about yeah, the I did business it once. and. It was once. That was fun. One, yeah, we went to <laughs> Korean barbecue. Yeah. Well, this has been fantastic. Thank you all for doing this. Really Thank you.